And here we go. It is Wednesday night. It is the uh, 8th of May, the day after the 7th of May. And this is going to be VT Talk, and it might be a slightly extended one, because we're going to be talking tonight about what happened yesterday in Europe at the NVE SIG workshop. And joining me to talk about this are two people who were part and parcel of the viewing party that we had. Um, and it's... It's something of a clever night tonight because, as you can see, we've got three Skype calls running at once in her, well, not in the doghouse, although it is the doghouse. But, but first, and, first and foremost, we have the effervescent and ebullient loveliness. Oh. <laughs> that is Sav, sat right, right the way over there in, in the little window. And I'm going to leave the rose between the two thorns to last because closest to me is the oceanic delightfulness that is <laughs> cerulean c or lorian as she's known how are you doing lorian you all right good thank you yes dd good good it's lovely to have you with us tonight but the rose between the two thorns the man who makes <laughs> me look like i've got hair it's mark shaw his very self who's joining us tonight so we've got we've got equals equal equals how are you doing tonight mark you all right yeah, very good, thanks, Dave. Well, as good as you can be after watching yesterday, but there you go. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. And and uh, Laurie and you, you watched the whole thing right the way through, did you not, from start to very finish, didn't you? I very much did, yes. And and did you enjoy yourself? I, I don't know if enjoy is the word. I, I definitely felt a lot of things. <clears throat> right. And it was, uh, but it was all, all good. I mean, I, I did notice some of the language that was used in chat and we'll, we'll not be repeating any of that tonight. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> well, let's just say there was an awful lot of custards in there. Um, there and were some. There was a lot of stars. Who knows what was beneath them? Custard. <laughs> yeah, just Mostly that. custard. Um, for the benefit of those people that weren't there, we are not going to play all three and a half hours of what went on. But we've... I've been through and selected a few bits and bats that uh, might kind of inform, possibly entertain if you're into building your muscles by throwing heavy things at the screen, um, and might serve to show how the whole thing went down. But before we get there, Laurie, let me start with you. What did you make of the whole thing? How would you sum it up? How would you, how would you describe it to anybody that hadn't been anywhere near and wasn't one of the 650 nearly? That have watched it online that I've that I know about. So how would you sum the whole thing up? Um, I would say there was a lot of suspicion in that room. A lot of suspicion. I think a lot of people were looking at the guys at that head table and wondering what was going on and why they were there and why this was even a debate. Um, and I think that came across in quite a few people's expressions and their body language and the questions they were asking. And to be honest with you, uh, people like McCavan looked seriously uncomfortable really uncomfortable yes i would go along with that mark what was your take on it yeah agree with what Lorian said there that most of the people there who was on the floor not sitting at the top table just seemed to uh totally disagree with everything they said uh it seemed that every expert they had i.e you had one on cardiology and you had one on respiratory they they didn't even talk about any effects on the cardio system or respiratory. They just digressed into conjecture on ev on everything and started. One of them even started talking about exploding batteries, and he was there to speak about the effects on the respiratory system. So mm -hmm. it just seemed, you know, as you said, it, it seemed to be a stitch up, but I don't think it quite worked in how they expected it to work. No, I would I would go along with that. I I, th I do think uh, you're right. I think it, it was in, it, it was a stitch up, without a doubt, it was a stitch up, but I think. Um, my feeling anyway is that the the protagonists of the stitch up showed themselves to be what they were um, and I, I could see just just looking around the video and, and folks will be able to see it as, as we play some of the bits in there's a lot of heads going like that when kind of some of the stuff comes up but shall we shall we drop into it and see how Ms McCavan introduced the whole thing and see how she was trying to set the tenor of what should have been a balanced debate, but just see how she started. Sit back and enjoy this. I hope you've all got 45 milligram in your tanks and your batteries are fully charged and you too have a bottle of Badger or Bombardier, which is <laughs> French Bombardier, you know, um, or, or whatever it is that takes you fancy. This, this is gonna run for about eight or nine minutes because it's about all of her I can stand. Enjoy. 
allow them to get here. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to this workshop. I want to say a couple of things about the workshop because I've seen some of the emails flying around and I've seen some of the um, things on the internet. Firstly, complaints by the industry that they're not invited to be speaking here today. This workshop was organized by, the, by myself and the committee because we wanted, we're discussing how to regulate e-cigarettes. The e-cigarette industry had a separate hearing, as they know, with MEPs a few weeks ago. And we heard your positions, and you've been sending your positions in to us. And we have them. I have a list now. I have all your comments. Some of them, some papers being circulated today from the industry. So they are here today. The idea today was to listen. Well, we, we had hoped to listen to the FDA, the Americans, but unfortunately they can't be here today because, as you know, they are also working on e-cigarette regulation. But we are going to hear from the World Health Organization to give us an overview of what's happening in different jurisdictions. Then we have regulators from different countries. I know I have met the UK regulator, but I have not met the other regulators, and so I do not know what the other regulators are going to say. Unfortunately, the German regulator is no longer able to be here. One of the reasons given for her not being here is the receipt of unpleasant emails about her appearance here today. Um, now, I, I know that people have very strong feelings on this subject, but I hope we all understand that we as MEPs are here to, to, to get the best possible regulation of these products, not to ban them, as is going around a lot on the Internet, but to get the best possible regulation. So we will hear the comments of the German regulator, but read by our policy department instead. But I don't know what the regulators in different countries are doing, but the same, and people say, why do we listen to the regulators from national governments? Why? I just want to make it clear. MEPs will not regulate on this alone. We have to reach agreement with council, with the ministers from 27 different countries, and they are taking advice from their regulators. So it's extremely important that Parliament knows what the thinking is in national jurisdictions about, um, about um, e-cigarettes. So we will listen to regulators. Then we will listen to some um, healthcare professionals. We invited the European Society to suggest some experts to us. I don't know those experts, and, I, and we will listen to what they have to say on the different issues um, about the, because MEPs wanted to know more about nicotine addiction and the differences between smoking cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And finally, there was a request from MEP to hear some users and we chose the Users Association from Germany because they have the most users of e-cigarettes at the moment. So that's what we're going to do. I've, I've read lots of other things that we have an unholy alliance between myself and the tobacco industry. People who know me might think, might, might think twice about that comment, and also the pharmaceutical industry. This workshop has been organized to listen to people so that MEPs can come to their own view. And that's what we're doing. We're going to listen, to listen to experts, take soundings, and try to come up with a framework. Because listening to industry as well, many of you have said that we need some kind of framework, and that is what we're trying to achieve. So, without any further ado, I want to move on. Thank you very much for that presentation. So, I'm now going to take questions um, to the two speakers who have spoken already. I'm going to prioritize MEPs at this stage. We have a lot of colleagues here, and if we've got time, we will take other people, but we've also got quite a lot of time allocated at the end as well, 45 minutes, 50 minutes at the end. I know colleagues have other meetings. So, um, I see Glennis Wilmot first of all. I see Chris Davis, Rebecca Taylor. Maybe somebody who's not British might ask a question. I can see other people. I'm going to take MEPs first, yes. Um, yeah, Lenny Swilmot. Just a very quick question to the Commissioner. How did you determine the threshold uh, on when you were dealing with e-cigarettes? Which should be dealt with under pharmaceutical legislation and which shouldn't? Yes, thank you. Uh, as I said before, a key consideration was the level playing field issue. So we looked at existing uh, products, existing nicotine replacement products of various forms, which have already been authorized in a number of member states as pharmaceutical products. And that was the basis of the limit. We took the lowest limit that had already been the basis for an authorization. And the reason we did this was apart from the level playing field issue, the fact is that 
the fact that the marketing authorization has already been granted in at least one member state shows that that concentration has been shown to be effective uh, for a particular therapeutic indication. So that was how we arrived at the limit. As I said, we, a prime objective for the Commission is to increase the level of legal certainty. So we proposed on the basis of actual experience. So the, uh, the threshold is not an arbitrary one. It's not uh, a, a level that the Commission somehow uh, arrived at. It's based on actual experience, products which have successfully passed the authorization procedure in member states. Okay, I've got Chris Davis. Well, briefly, uh, yes, of course, there should be further studies into e-cigarettes, and yes, there should be as much information given to uh, potential consumers as possible, and yes, there should be, there should be um, measures taken to ensure that the, the products are designed properly and are safe to use and, and such like. But we have hundreds of thousands of people dying of smoking-related disease each year. Tobacco is not a medicinal product. Why, is, why are you not making cigarettes a medicinal product? You know, that's a way of getting nicotine. I have, I, frankly, I, I, li I listen to all this, and of course you can, you can take virtually any product. I wouldn't be surprised if the carbon dioxide in this bottle, you know, there's all sorts of analysis you could, you could uh, subject that to. I mean, I could take you through seven months of watching my father dying from lung cancer as a, as a confirmed 60-a-day addict. And all I know, all I think is that, you know, with all the, the difficulty he had of giving up, I think e-cigarettes could have kept him alive for another 10 years or so. And I'm really appalled by, frankly, the, the, the overreaction of the Commission on this. I want, of course, we've got to take it sensibly and seriously, but if these save lives, then why put restrictions in the way of their use at this time? Yeah, go on. Well, a medicinal product is specifically designed to treat and prevent disease. It's in its definition. So clearly, the fact, yes, we have to, um, tobacco uh, smoking leads to 700,000 deaths in Europe uh, uh, alone uh, every year. So like, it should be treated like any other disease. It is a disease. Rebecca Taylor. Uh, thank you. Um, just to ask a couple of clarifications to the Commission. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that young people were attracted to e-cigarettes. Could you confirm if those young people were already smokers? Because all the evidence I've seen is that virtually, uh, I don't know what percentage, something was produced actually, I've sent it round to the Environment Committee today by ASH, the um, Action on Smoking and Health in the UK, to show that I think less than 1% of young people who tried an e-cigarette were not smokers. So basically the majority of them were already smokers. And the other thing about the gateway, I'd also understood there was no evidence, I, I haven't seen any myself, of e-cigarettes being a gateway to tobacco. Given that they don't taste like tobacco and tobacco doesn't taste very nice, um, I, would, I would heavily question that. Recent studies, as I quoted one from Hungary but there are others, studied a specific age cohort, 13 to 15 year olds, so very young. So clearly, um, at that age, hopefully, um, they are not already smoking, but even if they are, even if they are, and some of them probably are, they certainly would not be really addicted to the product. Because to be addicted at the age of 13, you must have started when you are 9 or 10. So clearly, we foc the studies focused on this specific age group, you know, to look at the attractiveness aspect of, uh, for young people. Evidence as to the gateway potential, I think... Clearly, for example, the fact is that unlike patches, unlike sprays, unlike gums, these products are designed to look like cigarettes. They, they, there, are even, there are even features added on to electronic cigarettes, like the light which comes on at the tip, which have absolutely no functional reason. It's just there to reinforce the perception that this is a cigarette. So, Yes, we'll just leave that there. Now, one of the points that came out there, and, and I want everybody to understand this, is that you can smoke for four years from the age of nine to 13, and you will not be addicted. Then he's an expert. In four years, you can smoke for four years, smoke tobacco four years, you won't become addicted, because it takes four years to become addicted, according to him. This is an expert. What it, what it, I mean, seriously, honestly, truthfully, Laurie, and I'll come to you first. What on earth did you make of all of that claptrap that we heard there? Sorry, I, would, I didn't mean to lead you in what I was wanting you to say. But what, what did you make of all of that? 
Well, the thing is, I think that's exactly what it was. Um, there are so many straws being grabbed out here, and I fully believe that you can look at any study and any bit of research, whether it's good or bad, and pick out the bits that you want and twist it. And I think that's what we're seeing with all these little things, is picking out the bits of information that they want us to believe and then throwing it back at us, even though it has no credibility whatsoever. And the idea, I've got an 11-year-old son, the idea of him now having been smoking for two years um, is is appalling, an appalling idea. The fact that we should just dismiss that as, oh, it's fine, kids can smoke for four years and they'll be all right, which is kind of what he's implying, that we shouldn't worry about it. That's cool. I find that deeply disturbing. At the same time as dismissing electronic cigarettes generally, to imply that is quite disturbing, I think. I, I, do, I do feel as though um, he didn't know what he was talking about. Mark, yeah. Mark, what uh, what do you make of all of that? The, the, and let's bring Chris Davies and uh, Rebecca Taylor into it. Let's never mention Ms. Wilmot again. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but yeah, as you said, Chris there, you know, that was the news, what someone said earlier on, that was news to all of us, you know, his reasons for getting behind this as well, which was quite moving. But uh, it, uh, Rebecca Taylor, we've definitely turned her to, to our side, of net, but they've both done their jobs, really. They've done what they're supposed to do. They've listened to their constituents. They've gone and done the research themselves, and, they, and they've listened to it, and they've took it on board. As for Martin Seychell, or well, whatever his name is, it, you know, about the, the, the uptake studies, he's cherry-picked one study, as Chris and somebody else put to him in that meeting. There's other studies that show that this isn't the case. Ash have actually published a study to say that that is not the case. Exactly children right. Children don't, don't, you know, children don't, but according to him, it's all well and good if they go and smoke from the age from 9 to 13, because they're not going to get addicted to it, so it's good. With Glynis, though, not Glynis, sorry, Linda, when she opened up there, some of the stuff she was saying, to, you know, in regards to, oh, MEPs are here to make up their own minds. They shouldn't be listening to this, that or the other. Well, she's obviously listening to somebody and it's not us. So, you know, she's getting her information from somewhere. And at the end of the day, she's had all the evidence bombarded to her by Twitter bombs, by all sorts, everyone emailing her. And you can excuse ignorance, but you can't excuse willful ignorance, in my opinion. I, I, will, I would agree with you. And, and I would also make the point as well that if she's the rapporteur, if she's the person guiding this through, it behoves her to understand everything there is to know about e cigs to read all of the literature, to be absolutely certain who it is that's being invited. Otherwise, how do you know that you're going to be getting the right information? And if, as she said at the top, she had no idea who the experts were or what they were going to say, then she's really doing an extremely poor job. Lorian, would you agree with that or...? Yeah, no, I would. I think it, it raises a lot of questions about how these things actually happen because this is ridiculous that we can have these guys making these decisions, or at least so it seems, with no information and no knowledge and can throw out misinformation and poor research and get legislation like this put through. I mean, is that how the EU works? Because I kind of had faith that things didn't work like that and they kind of knew what they were talking about. Oh, no, that's how the EU works. I mean, this Evidently. is... This has got an awful long way to go, but it's, it's made me look at other things as well. And I've, mm. and I've put my me, uh, me attention back where it ought to be. Sav, I'm seeing your eyeballs flitting from left to right at a hell of a rate of knots, which tells me the chat has got something to say. The chat have had an awful lot to say. Most of it I cannot read out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read out the, the comments that I've grabbed. Um, Sam Monroe had said, every argument that Linda McCavan made about the ESIC industry wanting to stall the directive so they can continue to sell product can also be put towards the pharma lobby for the opposite reason. All get is said, so the FDA now has influence over the EU. Midge Dog said regarding Linda, squirming like a pro, is she capable of taking responsibility for her own stance? Gillis has said, how can the lowest limit show a level playing field regarding the four milligram? Yes. Jeff Bedlin has said, um, they reduce the risk to life, they don't prevent it. I'm sorry, I can't remember what that was in relation to. <laughs> and Vaitman Daz has said, how dare he, who on earth does he think he is, to label me with a disease? Well, quite. I mean, and, and you know, I could ask for a show of hands, but I'll just, just sample the four of us. How many of us here think we are diseased? Not at all. I'm seeing a lot of head shaking. I'm not diseased. There's no wrong with me. No. Unless alopecia is a disease. <laughs> no. I, I, it, yeah, yeah, I could say the same about male pattern baldness. As far as I'm concerned, I do not have a disease. I do not suffer 
from a disease of anything addiction. I enjoy it. And to me, addiction's always, it's used in, if, if you like, with deleterious connotations. Is that too big a word to use? In other words, they, they kind of use it as a pejorative, uh, pejorative, pejorative, whichever, uh, to, to kind of say, look, he's an addict, therefore he's a bad man. Well, I hate to have to tell you this, but there's an awful lot of addicts that are very, very good men. And I'm one of them, if I'm an addict. And not that I think I am. What we'll do, we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll play in another little bit of video. There is some nice stuff here. There's some uplifting stuff. But we'll play another little bit of video in and we'll kind of talk it through from there. But I'm going to set a challenge. Here you go. Out of this first little bit that we've played, here's the challenge. Can anybody find which member state of the EU it is that has a medically authorised e-cigarette which runs at four milligrams. There's your challenge. You've got two minutes to find it. And we'll be back right after these messages. Don't go away. in Yorkshire for your basic needs. That's iVeber.co.uk and iVeber-elixir.co.uk. iVeber and iVeber-elixir.co.uk are proud sponsors of VeberTrails.tv. And we are back after that short break. So did anybody find out? Sav, have you got uh, anything from chat? Does anybody know? Um, nobody got the correct answer, but the best answer so far came from Ratfink saying, in answer to Dave, I reckon it's Neverland. <laughs> <coughs> it's Denmark. It's Denmark. Uh, Denmark have uh, full medical regulation in there. I think it's one of two countries in the EU that have uh, full medical regulation but Mark we were talking about that during the break and uh, it'd be interesting if you share what you what you shared with us with everybody else well yeah recently they banned uh, all the people in Denmark were getting around the nicotine ban their limits by getting in uh, nicotine juice as an insecticide basically as a pesticide but now that's recently been passed in the EU that using uh, nicotine as an insecticide has been banned Yes. So that leaves the Danes up the creek without a paddle, basically. But with that ban, even the head of the National Beekeepers Association over here, they had professors providing studies saying that they do not agree with that ban on the insecticides because now it just means that people are going to be using stuff that's 10 times worse than the nicotine, nicot nicotinoids. So, again, it was another thing that's, you know, why they're passing these bills. I have no idea, but... It doesn't give us much hope if you look at that side that they was getting all the expert advice to not ban them and they've gone ahead and banned them, you know. So, yeah, uh, but our friends in Denmark definitely need some help now because that leaves them without a way of getting their extra strength nick juice. Well, exactly right. And, and the thing is, I think it was, uh, it was nicotine they banned and neonicotinides that they would allow. And if I recall correctly, watching the Twitter, uh, Glenis Wilmot was all about the neonicotinoids. And trying to get them out of the way and leaving nicotine. I think I don't know. Anyway, whichever way, whichever way you slice it, it's uh, 
it's a complete not a fur 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 foul up and yeah, it uh, does make you wonder it makes you wonder an awful lot um i think we'll, we'll move into the second uh, second chunk of video um this is quite this is quite interesting i think um it's not massively long but again we'll play it in talk it through i've tried to pull out the salient points and there's one or two bits that we we want to look at um that kind of really show how idiotic the whole thing was let's run this in and uh, we'll talk about it when it's finished yeah, awesome. yeah. My name is uh, Ricardo Polos. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Catania. I'm uh, the scientific representative for the of the Italian League at Smoking. I just wanted to make a couple of comments to both rapporteurs. And um, the first question, uh, in, in a way, uh, connects very much to what you were saying. I don't know the, the name of the lady there. Actually, there is a quite a lot of evidence in the literature that uh, these products are no getaway to tobacco smoking. There are at least five papers. And I I'm, and I'm, and feel sorry for listening to you reporting an Hungarian unknown study that uh, I, I'm sure not even you know, uh, Jean-Luc. Uh, but there are at least five large papers, and uh, uh, they can back up that there's no such a concern. The other problem is, at the end of this nice talk, I'm still confused about the EU Commission wanted to regulate these products either as tobacco or as medicinal or as a general product. I mean, there's been confusion. I I'm sure many of you in the audience have shared the same. When you want to regulate something as a pharmaceutical product, you really need to look at the claim. So if the claim is smoking cessation of reduction, yeah, okay, in that case, regulation should go towards a medicinal product. We're still talking about nicotine, which is a, a not a new molecule, so some soft regulation should be applied in that case. And also, you know, I may be cynical, but even salt can be looked as a, and viewed as a medicinal product because salt can reduce high blood pressure. Are we going to regulate salt as well? Thank you so much. Um, I'm even more puzzled than, than when I entered the room, I must say. Um, the, the, the difference, the huge gap that seems to appear between the what we call in French le pays légal et le pays réel, the real, the real picture and, and the legal picture. It seems even bigger than it was. Uh, we, we, up to some point, understand the efforts of the Commission, uh, but now I have the feeling it's a bulldozer of the Commission wanting to, to have it all on the scope of the pharma uh, legislation, which, which certainly is a gift for them, but I wonder if it's going to be a gift for for the SMEs and certainly not for the users because it creates a difficulty for these SMEs to be on board and, and certainly for the users concerning the access to the products. So why such, I, I really wonder, it's not rhetorical, why such a, um, a huge discrepancies between your picture and the one that we catch, not from the industry, the one that we catch, most of us catch from our relations, our contacts with, with, with the consumers, with the users, with les vapoteurs en français, with the vapors or whatever in English, I don't know, those who use it and who individually not lobbyist, um, write to us and, and describe a totally different picture. So, and concerning the, the, I'm trying to make it short, concerning the studies, I, I don't challenge them at all, that you have coming, um, the, the, the young as a target, the young people, of course we share, we completely share that, they never have to become a target, and this is really a, a concern of us, but again, the, the young people that I meet all tell us it's way too expensive for us, so maybe the, the thing is it's going to get cheaper, I don't know, we have to be cautious about this, not becoming a seducing tool and, and, and less expensive, but for the moment, it's too expensive for them. So um, the, the, the figures that we have is that since we we've have this on board 10 years ago, we've only managed to reduce the, the first starters by one-fifth, 20%, 20%. Professor Dautenberg in France, for example, a very uh, well-known tobacconist, says that with electronic cigarettes that he doesn't like, that he doesn't like, but still at the end of the day, it's the same figure of, of people who quit smoking forever. So. There it is. It's, it's a new tool. We, we demand from them things that we have. We took 60 years to demand from the chemicals industry. And uh, I really wonder about the discrepancy. This is a huge puzzle for me.
Um, yes, uh, very briefly. My name is Jean-François Eter. I'm a professor of public health at the University of Geneva. Uh, with Ricardo Poloza, I think I'm among the few people in this room who actually conducted research on electronic cigarettes for several years. And I must tell you that the science of electronic cigarettes has not been fairly represented here today. Uh, a number of things have been said that have no scientific basis at all. Uh, among the things that have been said, uh, will, uh, as the WHO representative say, cigarettes we normalize e-cigarettes, we normalize smoking. If they help people quit, uh, then the contrary is probably true. Uh, and is dual use a problem? Well, if they reduce the number of cigarettes, say smoke, then it's a good thing, dual use. Uh, will they undermine smoke-free laws? Well, if people quit smoking, it will help smoke-free laws. As for the Commission, uh, they say that the threshold of 2 milligrams to nanogram is not arbitrary. It is entirely arbitrary. There is no science base at all between this threshold. And this threshold will have the result of prohibiting e-cigarettes because it's not enough. People need 20 milligrams, not 2 milligrams. And also, another very important point is that uh, the only company that has an e-cigarette approved uh, by the MHRA for clinical trials today, you know who it is? It is C and Creative owned by BAT, by British American Tobacco. So if you regulate this uh, as a medicinal product, the consequence will be that you will hand the whole business over to the tobacco companies as, as it is today. Thank you very much. Uh, I must say, as we start with the tobacco directive, uh, the whole uh, debate in the Environment Committee, uh, the e-cigarette was only a small part. Uh, but I must say uh, the Commission is fighting really hard for this small part to ban it because four milligrams <laughs> means to ban the e-cigarette from the market. And uh, there are so many question marks uh, because we have no scientific-based uh, studies and, and so on and so on. The question is, is it really the right place to include the e-cigarette in the tobacco directive? Is it really the right place? And there's, there's the question, is it really the right place? And, and I do apologise for sticking that little think bubble over Glenis Wilmot's head during that little part. And I know you couldn't see it, Lorian, but it just said, damn, this isn't going our way. Um, <laughs> that was uh, Ricardo Polosa, that was Frederic Reis, it was Groot, and it was uh, Jean-François Etté. Basically speaking up for e-cigs, not because they're particularly like you and me and everybody else, but because they know what the truth of the matter is. And, well, again, I'll throw it to Lorian straight away and, and, and ask, what did you make of that little lot where we actually had people that know what they're talking about talking? There, to be honest, there's a myriad of stuff in there. I think the salt argument was great and it had me whooping in my seat when that one came up because it's such an obvious one. Um, but the, the, what, what really interested me was the last guy bringing up the um, BAT thing because we're seeing this here and we're seeing this especially in the States. The fact is that the cigarette companies are getting involved in this because they know no matter what happens, this is not going to get outlawed. It's just going to become too expensive for everybody. And they know that, which is why they're getting involved. And everything that we saw there from all the different speakers was that suspicion that I was talking about. They're looking at this and going, this has no place here. Why is this taking up so much time in what should be quite an important um, piece of legislation? Where is all this coming from? It makes no sense. And they, they really did encapsulate that kind of feeling. Yes, I, I would agree with you very much, very much. Mark, your take? Yeah, well, that, 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 a lot of those responses was basically in reply to a lot of what Martin Seychelles said and uh, the World Health Organization guy was sitting up there. Yeah. All of this, I thought, was to do with an health issue, but they spent the majority of their time talking about sizes of markets and a fair playing field and, you know... It, it basically on a business angle rather than on an elf angle and you know they were saying oh the an ma for e-cigarettes won't be that expensive if you look at the size of the market oh we've got and, that to come yeah yeah you know and stuff like that. so it was just like that was you know in response to them but yeah the the, the university guy he kind of got his head ripped off a bit by glennis wilmot because she asked him if he had a conflict of interest uh, but he was actually putting forward quite some quite good points regarding assault and stuff. So, yeah, it, it, as I say, it, that was our side getting put across. I, I found the general feeling from the floor was pro e -cig, as you say. They're not doing it for the, for the sake of us, but they, they can see the benefits and they know they've done their research. 
Mm. Yes, well, absolutely. And, and the thing about it is, as well, um, what on earth? Right, sorry about that. My, uh, my little software decided to crash here. I can now switch cameras. There we go. Um, what they are probably aware of is that the, uh, the jury committee has already got the draft opinion in front of it. And they'll be discussing that shortly. And they're saying that one of the, the legal trip ups that there is for this is that they are talking about health and they need to be talking about the market because the, the basis for what they're doing, the legal basis for what they're trying to do uh, is about our common market and, and the marketing and, and stuff like that, the sale of it, nothing to do with health. And by talking about health, then it becomes illegal to do as far as the EU is concerned. So some of that might be coming into it. But I, I mean, I was, I was particularly taken with Frederic Rice. Um, oh, yeah. Not for that reason, Mark, not for that reason. <laughs> Although, um, but she, she, the way she phrased it, I thought was masterfully put, where basically what she says was, McCavan, you are spinning a web of deceit, a pack of lies, and I don't understand where you're getting all this from. And so is everybody else that's spoken against ASIG so far. Please explain to me why this is the case. That was what she was saying, but in what you would call parliamentary language. And I found that so refreshing. I mean, Pelosi's points about salt being a medicine, it's exactly the same as I've been saying for donkey's ages. And it's one of the reasons why I hate the attitude that uh, regulators and administrators take to the word quit. We know what we mean. I no longer light up a tobacco or cigarette. I've quit doing that, but I haven't quit what I was getting out of the cigarette. They take it to mean, of course, that it's total nicotine abstinence. And as you'll see from the rest of the video going through, um, there's an awful lot of this total nicotine abstinence that keeps on being referred to. Um, and in some cases, the figures go all awry. Uh, but that's basically because the World Health Organization can't do maths, and we'll see that a little bit later on. Sav, I'm gonna make the assumption that uh, we have some comments in chat. We have. Chat absolutely loved all of those speakers. Again, I've picked out a couple of comments. Uh, Midge Dog says, soft regulation, I like. Funny Trickster said, young people will always find a way to smoke or vape, no matter the cost, if they are determined enough. That's just what young people are like. Mm -hmm. Liam D. Vapor said, I'd rather young people vape than smoke. Cronus has said, well, hey, dual fueling, at last, someone gets it. Sam Munro said, sat between Glenis Wilmot and the only Swede in Sweden that's against us, I feel for Groot. And Liam DeVape has also said, I, I like to say it wasn't just UK people supporting e cigs. It seems all over the EU, the vapers are clearly working together. That's, that's certainly the impression that I get. And I, I sincerely hope that we carry on doing that. One of, the, uh, one of the things that gave me particular, I'll say the word delight, was the fact that uh, Groot is the chairman of the Envy Committee. He's the big I am. Um, and as such, he therefore must, you would think, have a little more sway, the casting vote, if you like, if it comes to, because uh, the 69 of them in the committee, isn't it? I think it's 69, or is that just my favorite number? Anyway, it's around about that. So if you get 34 versus 34, then Groot, I think we know which way he'll go on any of that which is all good stuff um and I, it, it, I found the whole thing quite uplifting that 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 second part and that made you feel good as well laurian didn't it it did yeah because i think it, it voiced a lot of the stuff that we've been that we've been thinking about and also shows that they've been listening to what we're saying which is i think from the very beginning of this is something i know i was concerned about is we weren't being understood and whether they care or not on a personal level they can logically see the impact this can have. And I think that's huge. I think it's massive. I think it's absolutely massive. And as I, I'm going to repeat what I said before and, and build on what uh, Frédéric Reis said. I'm going to stop trying to pronounce that in a French way. Frédéric Reis. Um, <laughs> she pointed out what I'd been thinking, that there is no way on the face of this planet can Linda McCavan not know what she needs to know in order to drive this thing through. There is not a hope in hell that what she said at the top of that meeting is in any way, shape or form based in fact. And indeed, 
I would relish the opportunity to sit down across a desk and have a conversation with her and find out what she really does know and let her ask me the questions to find out what she wants to know and I'll make sure that I take all of the links to the research and everything with me. So Ms McCavan, if you're watching, there's a challenge. Dare you take me up on it? Dare you sit across a desk from me and discuss e-cigs for two or three hours? Let's talk about them properly and I'll tell you everything you need to know and I'll introduce you to some people that can tell you everything you need to know that aren't big farmer shills. On which note, it's probably a good idea to go some adverts. Is that right, Sav? Am I advert time? Yeah, advert time, yes. Right, we'll go to the second lot of adverts, and when we come back, we've got more. It's all good, this. We might go over the hour. I'm not making any promises. Second lot of adverts. Here we go. And we're back in the room here on VT Talk on Wednesday the 8th of May, the day after the 7th of May, the day after there was all kinds of rubbish talked in Brussels. But it wasn't all rubbish. In fact, I have a new hero. And were I that way inclined, I would be having his children. I speak of Jean-Francois Etter, who is from the University of Geneva, is a very, very learned man. He's been, I'm not going to say he's been in tobacco control, but he's been in tobacco research, smoking research for 30 some years, I, I believe it is. Very, very well versed. Um, and he spoke at quite some length and was most enjoyable. Now, before we go into it, you'll remember Jean-Francois Etier very well, I would think. Do you not, Lorian? Say that last bit again. Sorry, I lost my connection. has been a bit dodgy. I'm sorry, Jean, Jean-Francois Etier uh, from yeah. University of Geneva. I think he yeah. delighted you quite a lot, did he not? Um, he we could say that, yes. Okay, Mark, did you pick that up the same way? Yeah, yeah, he was. He, he, he you know, he, he, as you said, there, a very learned man, and spoke. You know, he was an expert, and I'm sure one of them actually referred to him. I think it might have even been Frederic as an expert. Yes, um, <laughs> so much of an expert that um, indeed, yeah, he said, picking the wrong camera, I knew I'd get it wrong eventually, um, and I need to bring. Uh, there you go. You've darkened down. It looks really, really oceanic at the moment there. Um, <laughs> it does look good. I love it. Um, yes, where was I? Stop talking about technology, David, and get back to the plot. Jean-Francois Etté. If ever there is a man that is deserving of support, this is the man. Watch this. Um, hello. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. 
Uh, I'm a professor of public health at the University of Geneva, and uh, I spent most of the past 20 years studying tobacco dependence and uh, smoking prevention. I've developed instruments to measure tobacco dependence, and I've also conducted some of the very first studies on electronic cigarettes. I've published four such studies, and three others uh, will be published very soon. Uh, as for conflicts of interest, I have not had uh, any conflicts of interest with the, with the pharmaceutical industry in the past eight years, never anything with the tobacco industry. The uh, e-cig people paid for my plane ticket to, to visit them in China. Uh, I visited their factories there. It was extraordinarily instructive. Um, uh, I was asked to uh, speak about the uh, addictiveness um, of, uh, of electronic cigarettes. I guess this one. First ever study of cotinine, the main metabolite of nicotine, in uh, regular vapors, in, in, not in people who discovered e-cigarettes in the lab in the morning, but in people who actually are, are regular vapors. And we showed in this study that some of them, not all of them, but at least some of them, have levels of cotinine similar to level observed in smokers and twice as high as levels usually observed in uh, users of nicotine gums and patches. Maybe not all users have such levels. Uh, this is the second study uh, published, available to date, uh, of regular vapors by Tom Eisenberg and Andrea Van Zinkel. And they showed also the first part of the graph on the left, uh, up left, uh, uh, showing that uh, nicotine level in the blood substantially increase uh, after vaping for some time. Also another indication of the importance of nicotine, it comes from surveys of vapors, uh, some conducted by ourselves, and these studies uh, very consistent, uh, consistently, amazingly, uh, show that almost all vapors, 97 to 100% of them, use nicotine-containing liquids, juices as they call them. Uh, so we, we are speaking about a nicotine delivery device, not about a flavor delivery device or anything, it's nicotine. Uh, another, another thing that's very important for you to understand is, uh, is the concept of pharmacokinetics. It, it's extremely important. Uh, the addictiveness of a substance does not depend only on the molecule itself. It depends mainly on the speed of delivery to the brain and on the speed of activa activation of the reward system in the brain, right? So uh, tobacco cigarettes, they deliver nicotine to the lung and then to the arterial blood and very rapidly to the brain and they are very addictive. A nicotine gum delivers nicotine much slower uh, and it's, it is much less addictive. And a nicotine patch even much, much, much slower and nobody is addicted to the nicotine patch, right? So speed of delivery is crucial. Now, uh, from the elements that I've seen published and unpublished, uh, the, the, nic the speed of nicotine delivery by electronic cigarettes is, very, is closer to the speed of the gum and inhaler, a bit quicker, and uh, much slower than for cigarettes. So from this, we could uh, derive that they will be a bit more addictive than gums and inhalers, but less addictive than cigarettes. But this is a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Uh, now, even if they were addictive, is it a public health problem, right? Is it something you need to, to regulate just because they are addictive? Uh, as I said, the adverse consequences of long-term vaping are, are not yet uh, documented. And, and anyway, it, it's a lot, lot uh, safer than, than smoking, right? Uh, especially if e-cigarettes, and there's good evidence for that contrary to what has been presented to you to date. I, I think, again, that the science has not been fairly presented to you today. Uh, th there are strong indications, including randomized trials by Ricardo Poloza, who is here, uh, showing that e-cigarettes help people quit smoking, actually. Uh, and why wouldn't they, right? They deliver a lot of nicotine. Uh, they have a tobacco flavor, all the gesture, the throat hit, very important. That specific feeling in the throat that people feel when they inhale nicotine, they deliver it. So, of course, they will help people quit smoking. Um, uh, then also, a compulsive use of e-cigarettes can be treated. It can be treated with nicotine patches or with varenicline or with uh, counseling by a doctor or a psychologist. And also, uh, I, I, we, we must compare with addiction to the nicotine gums. 1% of all smokers who quit smoking with the nicotine gum remain addicted to the gum. This represents thousands of people in the European Union who are addicted to the gum. And most probably, one-third of all the nicotine gums that are sold are sold to people who are addicted to the gum, 
Okay? Is it a public health problem? You probably not even ever heard of it. Right? I studied addiction to the nicotine gum in, in a couple of papers. It exists, of course, it is not a public health problem. You, you even have never heard of it. Uh, is it a gateway to smoking in young people? This has been presented to you as a fact. It is not a fact at all. I don't, I, I'm not saying that it's not going to occur. I'm just saying that the available evidence shows that one, very few teenagers will use e-cigarettes and there are no data published to this day at all of conversion from trying. Of course, they will try a lot of things in their environment, but there are no data at all on conversion from trying any cigarettes to getting addicted to it. It may occur, of course, but it's not documented. And uh, nicotine gums flavored with fruit flavors are not a gateway to smoking in, in, in kids. But, uh, of course, there is an urgent need for more research on, on uh, the use of e-cigarettes by kids. Uh, are they used, the e-cigarettes, to inhale illicit drugs? Well, you can get artificial cannabis flavors online. You can also get models of e-cigarettes in which you place leaves of tobacco or leaves of cannabis through which the vapor goes through, and then you can inhale vapors. Um, in surveys, very few vapors admit to inhaling cannabis, and I know of no published reports of uh, uh, the use of e-cigarettes uh, by cocaine or heroin users. But if it delivers to the lung, they will, they will discover it, of course. Now, um, as a perspective, uh, the only thing that we can say about this is that research in, is urgent. Please uh, favor research, fund it, uh, encourage it. It's very important. Uh, in, in this paper published already two or three years ago in Tobacco Control, we established a research agenda with another of our, of our researchers. Uh, a, a list of all the studies that need to be done, electronic nicotine delivery systems, a research agenda. And I've also, excuse me, uh, you know, I have also written a book where I summarize a number of recommendations for policymakers, uh, research needs, and I, I, made, I made an honest attempt of uh, fairly representing the science on this topic, which you have not been presented with today. So, um, uh, there's a need for research on all these topics, uh, and it's urgent. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And I thank you very much to our three speakers. Um, so we'll take questions now. You, you, you'll be there at the end. So we'll, leave, we'll have the questions to the doctors, and then we'll take you at the end. Is that okay? Um, so I've noticed I answered my question about vapor. What's in the vapor, and is, is the vapor safe for other people around them? I, want to, I don't know if somebody wants to answer that question. Um, Before we ask other questions. Well, in the vapors, uh, you have propylene glycol, which, which is uh, not toxic, as has been said before. It's generally recognized as safe grass, as they say. It's used widely in medications uh, and, in, and in drugs and in, uh, in food and everything. You can even inject it. You have it's approved for injection. Of course, what is not known is whether it is safe when you inhale 150 puffs a day, uh, which is the average observed in vapors during several years. This is is not yet known. Then you have water, then you have uh, nicotine, which at, at the door, what you have been presented with is the poisoning symptoms. When people uh, use very large amount of nicotine, they can get poisoned, that's true, but in, in the amounts used by NRT users, I mean nicotine patches and gum users or vapors, it's not toxic. And, and then you have, uh, you have flavors or food flavors. Food flavors are not made to be inhaled, they are made to be swallowed, right? So the long-term effects of inhaling food flavors is not known. About the carcinogens, it's been repeatedly said today, what people did not say and, uh, and should be said, is that the carcinogens are found in the same level in, in nicotine gums and patches, and, and they are allowed for sale, and it's trace level, right? These detection equipments, they, they can uh, detect detect traces of something, it doesn't mean that it's dangerous for your health. And also about the diethylene glycol, it's been repeatedly said also the FDA, diethylene glycol, diethylene glycol, well, they found it in one very marginal brand that is withdrawn from the market, right? Well, now I've visited these companies in China and I know that what they manufacture is not according to any standard, right? So there's, there's a need for quality control, for sure, but uh, please. And that was Jean-Francois Etter, who we, we've just been chatting behind the scenes while that was going on. And Laurie, you, you said of uh, what Jean-Francois had said, that it was very balanced, yes? 
it was very balanced and it brought up a couple of very important points and that's looking at least from my perspective looking at the long-term effects um of what um this this system does to our lungs i think we have a problem there in that it's very difficult to do a long-term study on this because everybody using it is a former smoker so you're looking at lungs that have already been damaged by smoke it's going to be it's always going to be very hard to have um, a, st a study done because you're going to have to ask non-smokers to do this over an extended period of time to then see what effect it has on a non-smoking lung. I think the only way they can probably look at it is looking at smoking lungs, how you would assume a smoking lung should look after two or three years of abstinence um, and see how that compares. The other thing that I, I found very interesting was the thing about the flavours and it's all very well they are food flavors of course they're food flavors but we do need to know what happens when we put them into the system we vaporize them into into um something that we inhale because that isn't what they're intended for in that sense i mean obviously after however long we're all feeling a lot healthier than we were but in long term we do need to know these things it's it, what he said was very balanced and we've got to give him a lot of respect for that oh, well absolutely right i mean from the point of view of anybody sitting watching that they would i hope pick up that not only was he in favour of ACIGs, but he also had doubts about certain areas of them. It, it struck me that he was he was balancing the positives and the negatives, and saying out loud everything that was there. Mark, what what did you make of uh, Jean Francois Etier? Well, apart from the uh, German guy from the Consumer Association, he was the only one who sat out there and actually did give a balanced point of view. Uh, he was the only one who was the true expert, really, on, on e-cigarettes. And, you know, as, as Lorian said there, regarding the flavours and stuff like that, he made absolutely valid points. You go to the supermarket, you buy a food flavouring, it will tell you what's in it, but it will also say something like artificial food flavouring. Now, nobody knows what chemicals we use to make that artificial food flavouring. So, you know, these are things that we do need to know and we do need to find out the long-term effects of using those as, via inhalation rather than consuming. But I'm sure you're going to get onto afterwards that anything that you don't chew, eat or whatever is an addictive substance. I don't know if you've got that clip up, but that was one of the things that I'm sure Glennis Wilmot said, that if you don't chew it or inhale it, then it's an addictive, it can't be an addictive substance or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, he, he, uh, Martin, uh, that guy, is, he, he, he's is the only person on there who can, who, who you could actually say is a, a true expert on, on, the, on the field. Absolutely balanced, completely balanced. And, and the thing about the long term, a longitudinal study, a long term study, in order to see the effect that the inhalation of propylene glycol is going to have on the lung in human, you're going to have to do it over an awful long time. And you're going to have to get somebody, humans, that are prepared to actually take part in the trial. But it has been done, not just over eight years, but over 38 years that I'm aware of because as I've said before and as I said in a video that I put online I've been inhaling this stuff on stage all of my working life because all of my working life I've been on stage and we've been using propylene glycol and glycerin in the Hayes machines that we use on there it's very very well studied and I'm surprised that nobody's actually picked up on that it's really weird Sav what have we got coming in from chat we've got loads again so I will cherry pick <laughs> oh no you can't cherry pick <laughs> see what i did there you're going to be subjective now aren't you i am uh Kronos <laughs> says he has one of the only people on the top table with any clue round of applause for that man vapor stall said using the word vapors says it all Kronos again says, see, the psychology angle of this is if you allow kids to have something they don't really want it deny them however and we all know what happens. Absolutely. Funny Trickster says, uh, whatever they wonder about, it can't be as bad as the 4,000 chemicals in a cigarette, which Midge Dog also said, flavouring is pretty minimal in my mixes, but they scare me far less than the 4,000 odd chemicals in a real cig anyway, so mm -hmm. I'll take the long-term potential risk. Mm -hmm. And DWCHP says, it gets better and better, this guy is just slaying them. Absolutely right. And, and, and the fact of the matter is when you've got balanced science, not junk science and not big pharma shills, you can actually see where there needs to be some level of, of regulation, legislation, administration, call it what you will. And in actual fact, it does need to be, if anywhere, on what constitutes a juice. 
we need, we do need to know that juices are being made in the right places, in, in sterile, is it sterile environments? Who was that? I have no idea. I've just been beamed up. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Are you a closet trekkie? Uh, yes, fully. Pic picture of an embarrassed lorry and there we go. Back to me. Back to me. I'm on a horse. Um, right, where were we? Yes. What was I saying? All right, yes, juices. I, I do want to know that my e-juice is created in laboratory conditions where people have got night rail gloves on, where their beards and their hair and everything are masked off. I don't want juices created on somebody's living room table or in their bathroom or in their own suite or where the hell ever. I do want to know that they're being created properly. And I think that is where, that's the only place that the EU needs to be diverting its attention so shall we say the rest is all straightforward because the bottom line on it is this thing i've got my hands just a torch i'm going to go closely up we come on this do apologize but there you go i can't this this thing's just a torch it's all it is just a battery holder with some electronics in and you can, you can stick a bulb on the top if you like it doesn't have to be an ithaca or what the hell ever that i'm using on on, on a particular day it can be anything you like it doesn't make any difference it's what goes in that's the important stuff now from my perspective, four milligrams, complete waste of time. 20 milligrams, maybe, but I'd never have it out of my mouth. That's not necessarily a bad thing, if you like what you're doing. Um, 36, 45, that's, that's where I'm at. But I do want to know, I do want to know that it's made right. And it's got to be made right, because if it's not, you don't know what you're getting. Um, outside of all of that little lot, though, I mean, Jean-Francois Etier, really stuff. Seriously, really stuff because that's a bloke that should be in front of Linda McCavan every day until she bows down and realises that he is what he what he's purported to be. He is a true expert. I rank him up there with Jerry Stimson, with Clive Bates, with uh, Michael Siegel, with Hajek, with with, with with all of the Pelosa and 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 uh, Constantinos Farsalinos. All of these people know what they're talking about because they're not biased. They're not industry shills like that Pissinger woman who is just not getting any airtime on this show she's just not because all she came out with was a farrago of disinformation and lies and I'm not going to subject our audience to that because it would be unfair it would give you high blood pressure it would make your bowels erupt you would you just you you wouldn't enjoy it it would be absolutely awful tell you what we will do though there was you you mentioned earlier on Mark Mr Bertolini did you not yeah yes yeah. The, the man famous for Olivia Spread. No, it's different. that's Bertolli, isn't it? <laughs> it might as well have been Bertolli. Now, I, I have to tell you, I'm surprised he's got any kids left. Yeah. Because am I right in thinking, Mark, that uh, his, his wife is a teacher and she lets kids use e-cigs in her classroom? Well, well, everyone, everyone from his son having an asthma attack. Like, and this is the guy, again, who was there to talk about effects on the respiratory system and he started going off on things about batteries and things like that. And, and as you said, his wife was a teacher and he's saying, oh, all the children are using them in her classroom. So, you know, he just came out with conjecture after conjecture. But I find that quite positive that you had a cardiologist specialist, as you said, there in Kissinger, and a respiratory specialist. And they both couldn't really provide any evidence on what they was there to provide evidence on. They just had to go off on these angles of, you know, think of the children and exploding batteries, this and it. And you're thinking, but hang on, you're not there to talk about that. You're there to talk about health concerns. And they couldn't actually bring any up. That I find that quite positive in a negative kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. I mean, the, yeah. the, the fact of the matter was, you would have thought that they'd have been able to present compelling, unarguable evidence to back up their, their, their stance, and they couldn't. In fact, what Mr. Bertoli, Bertolini came up with, and he's going to get tweeted about this until he's blue in the face, I'm absolutely sure. I'm just going to play it in. He, he's got a second son. Listen to this. Now my second son is asthmatic, and he was in a library uh, with some friends uh, using e-cigarette, and he had a, an asthma attack. Maybe... Not a cause, uh, you know, any di direct cause effect, but what I, I have in my family, 
is that I had a, a, an asthma attack. So uh, you are the one out of ten. Your, uh, your rate of death is 100 percent. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the main point is certainly you reduce the, the harm, but you have to, to go to the, <laughs> to the zero problem. So the zero should be stop smoking. The way she presented that was really clever, really, really clever. That was kind of public speaking stuff. It was very deliberate the way she phrased it and she worded it in the pauses she left. She wanted those words to have an impact. Frederick, yes, she did. Sorry, we, we were discussing that while, while Mr. Blassie, I do apologise to Mr. Bertolini. That was Mr. Blassie, whose family apparently is all dying due to e-cigs and, and apparently who where one in ten is 100%. Um, this followed on from, as, as you were saying, uh, Laurie, and this was uh, a question from uh, Frederick Rice, was it not? Yeah, yeah, it was. What I was talking about was the fact that watching some of these people speak, there was a, obviously a very different level of personal involvement in what they were talking about. But the way she spoke, she was very clever in the way she phrased what she was talking about. And you were saying when she said that one in every two smokers died, she, she stopped and then she repeated it again and she waited to let that figure sink in before then talking about even if it's one in 100 um, electronic cigarette users dying, that essentially is a number we cannot ignore. That's a fantastic comparison. But the way she presented it was very professional and it was meant to have an impact, which I thought was quite impressive and quite um, uh, just another very important moment from these sort of three hours of hell. Yes, absolutely, I would agree with you. Uh, but the, the, the fact that this, this uh, Blassi fella, who is from the European Respiratory Society, had to take that one in ten and twist it and say, that's 100%. It's yeah. like, how the hell do you get maths like that wrong? Yeah. How do you get maths like that wrong? And how can you possibly hope to convince people? Now... My feeling that was that, that most of the MEPs that were there would have gone out at the end, shaking their heads and going, this is just absolute rubbish. We have been fed a farrago of lies by these experts that have been brought in um, by Pochka Langer, who put it all together, apparently. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the 1,200 amendments that have been tabled to the proposed revisions to the Tobacco Products Directive will take an awful lot of discussing. Um, they will be published. They will be there for all to see. But there is actually a matter that's probably slightly more pressing for us. Because during the course of the three and a half hours that we endured yesterday, and Mark's endured again today, and I've endured three times today now while I was cutting all these bits out, Possibly for us in the UK, one of the most important parts, potentially, was what Jeremy Mean had to say. Now, Jeremy Mean is one of the big wigs at the MHRA, and he spoke at quite some length about what was going on. And I make no apologies for playing this in. I make no apologies for overrunning. Before I do play it in, though, I'm going to go to Sav and find out what chat's been saying. Um, and then we'll play this in from the MHRA and we'll have a little quick natter about it and be finished by half past, I hope. So, Av, what are they saying? We've had absolutely loads of people in chat talking about asthma and the fact that they've gone from using an inhaler a week to they're lucky if they use them one in a month and some people are not using them at all. Absolutely loads. And again, there's been lots of comments about um, the study done by Dr. Farsalinos that was there and they all just ignored it. Loads of comments about that. Yes, indeed. Um, I have been reliably informed, um, and I've got to say this, and I'm upset to have to say this, but I've been reliably informed by my uh, contacts in Brussels that the likelihood is that no matter how big the cohort that Dr. Farsalinos comes up with, it'll be ignored by the EU, it'll be ignored by Envy, and it'll be ignored by legislators because it's a self-selecting report. We've chosen to do it. However, on the flip side, Ms. Pissinger's report, with the emphasis on the Pissinger, um, that was all taken from forums, which is kind of self-selecting in and of itself. And she relied on that. And, you know, I don't think they can have it both ways. If they're going to take one, they've got to take both. But that's what I'm being told. Anyway, let's kind of move a little away from there and go into Jeremy Mean of uh, the MHRA. 
and let's listen to what he had to say and see whether we can glean any hints as to what's going to be coming. Towards the end of this, you might. You might not feel that good about it. Like I said, make sure your batteries are charged. Make sure you've got the 45 in there. If there's anything heavy handy, put it out the way. You might want to throw it. In 2010, in the UK, we held a public consultation on the regulation of nicotine-containing products, including electronic cigarettes. And at that time, the UK government made very clear that its preferred option was to use medicines regulation to ensure that products that met appropriate standards of safety, quality and efficacy were available to smokers to help them cut down to help them to quit and to reduce the harms of smoking and, and perhaps I'll come back to the harm reduction um, argument uh, in just a moment. The results of that public consultation were very clear and very strong from what I would call the public health community, from healthcare professionals, from smoking cessation providers, uh, from public campaigning organisations, that they saw medicines regulation as a very useful framework in which to make products available. Picking up on the point that Martin Seychelles made, nicotine replacement therapy is widely available. Its cost is not significantly different from electronic cigarettes or tobacco products. So the idea was not to ban products, but actually to make products that met appropriate standards available to people uh, and widely available to people. Now, the results of that consultation, while very strongly supporting medicines regulation, also raised concerns that these products, which are potentially useful to smokers, and for some smokers, have allowed them to achieve their goals of reducing smoking, cutting down or quitting, then those products, uh, if we removed them wholesale from the market, would actually have a risk of damaging public health rather than improving public health. So the, in the UK, we set about a programme of work which has taken some two years to complete and uh, it will be published next month. I was interested in what Professor Bartoloni said about publishing the WHO position next month. What we have tried to do in the UK is to bring together an analysis of how these products are used, what's contained in them, what the impact on public health might be from all the data sources we have available. So published and unpublished studies, some work that we have commissioned ourselves on the content of electronic cigarettes and the delivery of nicotine. And we hope to publish all that information next month to inform this very important debate. What we also did, and here's perhaps where I'll come on to the, the list of questions that Linda talked about, was to look at the current regulatory framework. Uh, Professor Bertoloni talked about a, a loophole in the UK. The position in the UK and, and a significant number of other member states is that they have allowed the general product safety provisions to become the default mechanism for regulation. And what we have done in looking at how that regulation meets the concerns of these products is to look at whether it's a, a very good fit, whether it manages the risks of electronic cigarettes. Now, Martin Seychelles talked about the, the nature of the General Product Safety Directive. It is a, a kind of catch-all to catch everything from, from furniture to, to toothbrushes. It does capture some important elements. It, it captures battery safety, for example. Um, it covers things like labelling and the extent to which nicotine must be labelled. But it doesn't capture the content of the product and its safety in delivery and in particular long-term safety. It doesn't have specific product-specific provisions around advertising. It doesn't manage the risks around providing effective products for people that actually work. I was interested in what Martin Seychelles said about balancing risks and benefits, which is what medicines regulation does. It's the, that's the basis for the way medicines are regulated. And the comparator here is smoking. So yes, we want to be sure that these products work, and yes, there is limited evidence, 
But there is evidence that people are finding them useful, successful. There is certainly evidence from a whole range of published studies, including uh, one published today by Ash, uh, which uh, was mentioned earlier, which suggests people use these products in exactly the same way as licensed nicotine replacement therapy. They use them to cut down. They use them to quit. There is some dual use, as there is with licensed nicotine replacement therapy. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence that that's a significant or long-term problem. I was interested in the comments about Gateway and in particular about young people's use. And again, we've looked at what survey evidence is available. Um, the picture is not entirely clear. It is mixed in some areas. But there isn't significant evidence of Gateway and young people's use being a significant problem currently. It is a risk, and a risk that needs to be managed going forwards, and it's important to have the right regulatory tools to manage that risk. And we certainly don't have those in the UK in relation to the General Product Safety Directive, but we have been thinking about whether medicines regulation is the right fit and, and does give the right tools, and that, uh, a decision on that in the UK will be given next month. But just to give you an idea um, around the capability of medicines regulation. It does have a framework around advertising. It does have limits in the indication on ages that can be used. It does have a requirement that the rational use of the product is promoted, actively promoted. So it does have tools to manage the risk we've identified. It also has requirements around safety, quality, and efficacy, but not in a way that can ban products, actually, in a way that can enable products to come on the market, to make claims, um, and to be used by smokers for, uh, what, for the reason that they are using them, with good product information to tell them about the length of use and how to effectively uh, reduce their smoking and to quit. Now, Linda, you mentioned the, um, the European Commission's proposal. The UK's position on that is not finalised. But I did want to say a few words about the two key elements because they have come up in discussion. The first is the warning around nicotine. It's already been mentioned that nicotine is a, a substance that its use is very well established, its safety profile is very well known, and it's significantly less harmful than addiction to tobacco. So we certainly wouldn't want to see a warning that um, damaged the, the reputation of nicotine and its capability to improve public health. So we would like, with the Commission, to look very closely at the warning for nicotine products. We've talked, too, about levels, and this is an issue which, uh, when I've been talking to regulators uh, around the world, in the States, in Canada, and in other member states, we have struggled with found it difficult to ha think about how to apply medicines regulation in these circumstances. Now, I, I should, before I say any more, I should say I don't have an answer, but I can give you some of the difficulties that we've been struggling with. We wouldn't, for example, say of another active pharmaceutical substance like paracetamol, that at a very low level, it's not a medicine. We would say at a very low level, it's not effective, but we would still want it regulated as a medicine. Paracetamol is a good example because when people take multiple products, they risk overdose. Now, in relation to nicotine, dose is quite a difficult thing to define because users, whether of cigarettes or electronic cigarettes or indeed nicotine replacement therapy, tend to try titrate their use. They use the nicotine until it relieves their craving, and then they use it no more. And that's a very difficult thing to define in law. We, too, have been struggling to think about how to define it in law. We don't know the answer to that in the UK. Um, we think there may be solutions in thinking about what the, the levels are, whether blood levels is the right way to think about them. Uh, we're not yet clear, but the UK's position on those elements uh, will be published next month. Um, now, I did just want also to ask uh,
come to the questions, Linda, that you raised around the cost of regulation uh, and whether that's a barrier um, and whether uh, a question that is sometimes raised about cigarettes being less regulated uh, than <coughs> medicines. Now, in terms of cost of regulation, there are burdensome elements of medicines regulation. It requires good manufacturing, uh, um, good manufacturing practice because these products are consumed uh, in the lung with chemicals that are uh, uh, potentially of a high risk. So we think any regulatory framework should have good manufacturing practice. We think that any regulatory framework should have controls um, around advertising. And actually more and more, as you start to think of what you would see in an optimal regulatory process, it is, as Martin says, medicines regulation um, as a good fit. But medicines regulation is not prohibitive. There are existing licensed nicotine <coughs> replacement therapies. Um, in an industry which the European Parliament briefing said that in 2010 amounted to about 500 million euros, the cost of regulation is relatively small. And many risk, uh, many um, impact assessments that look at the cost of achieving a marketing authorization talk about between 100 and 200,000 euro annualized <coughs> over a period of 10 years. So by the, by the size of the industry, it's a relatively small amount. The non-prescription medicines industry in Europe is uh, something like 200 billion pounds Europe-wide. So it's a very small element of that. And finally, Linda, you asked a question about regulating cigarettes in a proportionate way. Now, we think medicines regulation is already proportionate. It has a spectrum from dealing with brand new chemical entities around which we know nothing to dealing with products that the safety and efficacy profile is very well established. Nicotine is one of those, first licensed in the 1970s. There's been an inhaled form of nicotine around since 1997. We know a lot about the safety profiles uh, of these products. So we can make regulation fit around that in terms of what we know about the safety and how that maps across to newer products coming through. A point was made earlier about the reference product being smoking. Medicines regulation allows us to think about risks and benefits. And when the harms are so great, uh, we may take more risks uh, in the licensing process. We've heard also about the lack of regulation around cigarettes. Well, cigarettes are regulated in terms of um, uh, they are not allowed to be advertised, they are not allowed to be promoted, and they are subject to high taxation all of which are regulatory strategies designed to um, drive down the use of these products. Actually, we want to drive people from smoking products to using nicotine replacement therapy products, which if licensed, they would be just that, uh, another form of nicotine replacement therapy product. So I'll stop there um, because I think I've addressed the main questions you raised, but very happy to, to come back to those. And that was Jeremy Means, uh, Jeremy Means, sorry, there's no S on the end, of the MHRA. Now, I have been trying all day to put together whether that was a hint as to what's going to be coming up because they're going to announce in June, not in 18 months' time, in June, there's going to be an announcement made. And I'm hearing all sorts of conflicting information from here, there and everywhere. But I, I, and I want to ask the crew, Lorian, what, 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 what do you think is going to be coming out of that? Is it going to be anything sensible? Is it going to be medicines legislation? What do you think the MHRA is going to go for based on what Maine said during the course of that? He said a lot of things. Um, a little birdie talked to me about this, and I have a lot of respect in what they've got to say, actually, because they've got a bit more experience than I have. Their feeling from this is that they're going to bypass where medicines normally go through being prescribed by doctors and whatnot straight to it being an over-the-counter medicine. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think we have to bear in mind that whatever happens um, between now and September with the EU, 
whatever happens, we have still got a battle on our hands with the MHRA. Potentially, this isn't just going to go away if Lynn McCavan wakes up tomorrow no. and no. gives this whole thing up as a dream. It's We've still got other stuff going on. And I think everything he said today showed us there is there are still other things to be worried about. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. Um, Mark, what did you make of it? Yeah, it, it, it was quite confusing to listen to. He's quite clever in his presentation as well. But uh, sometimes, you know, he was going on about we need to regulate these, as you know, like saying about the medicines route. Then he started to talk about uh, the previous position the MHRA had on this about putting them as medicines and saying, you know, but we listen to people and, you know, talking about thresholds and things like this. And then he would go straight back into saying, but obviously the you know all the frameworks there as regulating and as medicines. So I do think that that's that's the way he's going to go. I really do. But it just seems to me as well what we were saying there, you know, during during that clip, all these experts are all saying these e cigs are really bad. They're really bad. They're really bad. But if you give them to us, they'll be absolutely fantastic. You know, and, you, you're so right in what you say. That's exactly what they've been doing all the way through. Exactly yeah. what they've been doing all the way through. What you currently have doesn't work, but let us regulate it, and it'll work better for you than it currently does. Only, I don't think it will. With the MHRA thing, I do believe we need to be talking to our MPs now. Absolutely now we need to be getting hold of them and giving them the benefit of what we've learned talking to MEPs. I do. I think we need to be talking to them and, and saying, look, this is coming up. We're a little bit worried about it. Um, we think it's a parliamentary matter. We think you need to be involved. We think you need to stop this happening. Um, and, and here's a, a framework that we would like to see adopted. And from my point of view, it's the ACETA framework with no changes in the 75 milligram uh, limit that's already there. I think we need to be pushing for that because it seems to me to be sensible. It, it concentrates on the right things unlike some of what we've been hearing going on in the EU. Sav, so I'm seeing your eyes flitting about the place, so I know chat's got a lot to say on this one. Chat, I've got loads. I'll just run through everything I've got. Um, Vaping Point Liz said, I thought he kept his cards close to his chest. I didn't understand a word. <laughs> Marco Van Basten has said, he gives with one hand and takes away with another. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sam Monroe says, yes, publish all the information, not just what conforms to a bias. Kronos says, Ash have gone off message, so they have been sidelined. Jeff Benyon, the risk from e-cigs is way less than the risk from cigarettes. Everything else is pompous rubbish to line their own pockets and give them the feeling that they are not custards, but important people. <laughs> <laughs> Funny Trickster has said, all we need is quality control, so we know we're vaping what we think we're vaping. Nothing more, nothing less. Mm -hmm. Fuzzy Ann said he's talking complete gobbledygook. And my two favourite comments, Kronos has said, Sunshine, you're a public servant. What you want doesn't matter a damn. What the public wants is what matters. Mm -hmm. And Funny Trickster has said, I don't cough as much as someone in that room. And the, uh, yes, absolutely, I would agree with everything that's there. I think we do need to be getting hold of MPs. We do need to be taking the battle that we've been fighting on the EU front and fight it on the MHRA front. I think we need to be doing what we've been doing, but a little bit more locally, uh, just to make our, our presence felt, shall we say, and try and get something sorted out about it. Um, this has been a special extended version of VT Talk, and I want to thank my two guests, uh, Lorian Cerulean, not Cairolean, <laughs> Cerulean C, Lorian, and uh, Mark Shaw, who, who have come along and joined me tonight. And thank you so much, the pair of you, for doing that. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Yeah, it's been great, Dave. Thank you. Cool. Good, good. Um, and I hope I'll see you both again a lot more. Uh, we've, we've, we've brought you as much as we can conceivably bring you without either making your blood boil or without making you go to sleep. Um, Sav, thanks again for the, the marvellous job that you do. I've... I've I've been Dave Dawn, I've been here as your servant and I'm doing my best to bring you what we can in the news about e-cigs, no matter where it's happening. Um, I'm going to have a late night tonight because I'll be on uh, vape team at half past two in the morning. But until tomorrow night, when I've got the two Keiths, Keith Mark 1 and Keith Mark <laughs> 1.2 will be with me, no doubt, with cargo pants and loads of pockets. 
Uh, if I get a chance to get some video edited down, there's going to be a nice build going on. We're just going to have a natter because I've been so, so taken up with what's been going on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sticking with us from all of us here on VT Talk. Good night. Say good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. See you next time.